Music has been a part of my life since I was a child. My father was song leader for the Church of Christ. I first learned how to read music by shape notes that were used in the uh, that very fundamentalist church, and uh, <clears throat> so we were all we were always there. It was a large family. We never went to the regular churches. We would either go to uh, the church that needed people in its audience, or we would go to black churches. And in Abilene, Texas, that was quite unusual. But when the, the five or six or seven page children were all there with mother and father, music was just part of my DNA from the, from the very first. I never dreamed of going into it as a profession. My father's attitude about music was it was next to being a, a minister or an elder, that was the greatest thing, singing for the Lord. My mother said that without music, you're not going to be a decent citizen. I'll put Beethoven's mind up against Einstein's any day. I was studying piano with a blind piano teacher, and I paid for my lessons, beginning as a sophomore, by dictating piano music to her, which she would transcribe to a Braille typewriter. And I was learning, didn't know it at the time, but I was learning the horizontal and the vertical structures of music. Some of the greatest things that you learn, you're not aware that you're learning them at the time and they somehow later on fit into your life. Uh, I graduated from high school at age 16, and... uh, went to Abilene Christian College. It's now Abilene Christian University for two years, and then I went into the Navy, the end of World War II, and uh, was in there uh, 18 months, something like that. And then while I was there, I was in San Diego, and I got a good voice teacher, and I stumbled into uh, singing leading roles with the San Diego Light Opera Company at age 19. And I knew then I couldn't stay out of music. I went back to Abilene Christian, got my degree, and had my first teaching job at Odessa, Texas High School. And then Eastern New Mexico University contacted me, offered me a job, and I made the switch into higher education. And we had some incredibly talented people. I had a, I had a very good choir, uh, and the word had gotten around. So that Hans Lange, who was a violist, with Toscanini, the NBC Symphony, had retired to New Mexico and was conducting the Albuquerque Symphony. I did the Messiah because Hans Lange got sick, and they said, would you conduct the performances? I said, yes. I'd never been in front of an orchestra in my life. They offered me the job at Temple. My first job at Temple was to prepare the Carl Orff Triumph of Aphrodite for the Philadelphia Orchestra and Eugene Ormandy, and that started it, a whole new world.
I, I tell everybody, I guess maybe I've had three semesters of conducting in my life. I learned it all on the job. I make no bones about it. If they say, I am going to be a professional musician, they are the true lovers of music because they have given their life to it. They have not tacked it on to something else as an enrichment of themselves. They have taken a chance that they're going to make a living at it, but that doesn't take away any of the joy or the enrichment but it adds another idea of the commitment. The professional is the giver. In 1976, when I moved to Pittsburgh to take over, uh, to be the head of the Department of Music at Carnegie Mellon, uh, I came here to be an administrator, period. You know, But in 79, uh, I was called into the PSO office by Cy Rosen and three members of the Mendelssohn board and ostensibly for me to recommend somebody to uh, head the Mendelssohn choir because it had been, uh, it had fallen out of favor uh, with Previn, et cetera. And uh, I said, I'm not interested in another non-professional choir. I said, I have one of the best in the country in Cleveland now. I don't, I don't want another one. So that, but they kept hounding me. And I said, yes, if you will give me a professional corps of singers and a position with the symphony, I will. So I didn't think they would, but they did. I had auditions three times in that one year, trying to get somebody to do something. And finally, one mezzo-soprano named Carol Levy came for the third audition. And suddenly, this gorgeous voice came out. It never had shown before. And I said, Carol, what was this? You've never, you've never used that voice before. She said, we were told not to do that. In your choir, you're not supposed to use your voice. You're supposed to use a choral voice. I said, it's, You can tell that my career has not followed the greased path of, uh, of the politically correct thing. I've been my own, my, my own boss. I've sort of walked to my own drum, and I like that. And in teaching, I look for the student who has guts enough to walk to his or her own drum because they're going to do something. They're going to do something. Glenn, my wife, was head of the voice program, uh, the music theater program for the drama department at Carnegie Mellon for 20 years. And uh, our two daughters, Paula is the principal harp with Houston Symphony, and Carol Ann, my youngest daughter, is an internationally known uh, singer-actress, created the role of uh, Pat Nixon in Adams Nixon in China, and sung, sang it all over the world.
The thing about performance is passion. And without that, it's not, music is nothing.